is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce our Kavanaugh Award winner this, this uh, evening, Judge Alex M. Calabrese. Um, I'd like to thank Executive Director Dolly Duffy, the entire Alumni Association Board of Directors for this award. I want to thank also Senior Administrative Assistant Nancy Cole, who has been a great help assisting myself and my family so we could all be here. Thank you, Nancy. My sincere congratulations to the other Alumni Association Award winners this weekend, Rear Admiral Matthias Winter, Mr. Chris Stevens, reading their achievements and those of the past winners of the Father Kavanaugh Award, it's an honor, a real honor, to be included in this group. The University of Notre Dame has played a major role in my life, my family, and my work. And I'd like to introduce my family. My wife, Linda Temple, is a St. Mary's graduate, class of 76. I was class of 75, she's class of 76. We met her freshman year, her first week on campus. By that time, I was a crafty sophomore. <laughs> Who knew we had to meet the St. Mary's girls early before they realized there were seniors and juniors with cars on campus. <laughs> she is the executive director of services at HeartShare Human Services in New York. She took an agency with about $30 million in services, and through her efforts and hard work, they now provide over $100 million worth of services and programming, assisting those with developmental disabilities and those on the autism spectrum. She started the first school for autistic children in Brooklyn, New York. She works incredibly long hours. You are, and always will be, the love of my life, and I really can't believe how lucky I am that you married me. And I'm glad I got the chance to say this. Thank you. Our daughter, Corey, Notre Dame class of 2006, upon graduation, volunteered for a year with AmeriCorps, working with Habitat for Humanity in New Orleans after Katrina. She's an attorney, has worked nationally and internationally for women's rights, is presently clerking for a federal judge. Our daughter, Allie, you might see a trend here, Notre Dame class of 2009, earned a doctorate in physical therapy. All her patients love her. She started a running club for young women to help build up self-esteem. She is allowed to volunteer at the local animal shelter, so long as she does not bring any more dogs into our family. <laughs> Now, the Notre Dame Navy weekend is really special for us. As Allie met her husband, Lieutenant Patrick Cashin, he's a specialist in nuclear reactors on submarines. He's visiting from Annapolis for a Notre Dame Navy game at the time. Uh, you said 10 years ago, right? Yeah, 10 years ago. With the exclusion of the Notre Dame Navy game, Patrick agrees to root the rest of the year for Notre Dame. We agree to root for Navy over Army every year. I am incredibly thankful, and I'm really proud of their accomplishments. Now I want to tell you how important Notre Dame has been in my work. I am a Supreme Court Justice in the state of New York. I've been the presiding judge of that Red Hook Community Justice Center since its opening 15 and a half, 15 and a half years ago in April of 2000. It is a one-judge court. We do have criminal, family, and housing court jurisdiction. I cover 230,000 people in my catchment area in Brooklyn, New York. If you've heard of Red Hook, Brooklyn, it's probably because our local school principal, Patrick Daly, was killed on December 17, 1992, when he left school to retrieve a student who had left school. He got in an argument. He went to get the kid, bring him back to school. He was caught in a crossfire between two drug gangs, uh, and he was killed. And at that time, Red Hook was labeled one of the top 10 crack-infested communities in the United States by Life magazine. His murder was not an isolated incident. Red Hook was a drug-ridden urban war zone, and there was gunfire in the streets. So much so that if you lived on the first floor of the Red Hook projects, you taught your children when they heard a bang, hit the floor. Bang, hit the floor. And on particularly violent nights, you would put your children to bed in the bathtub because that was the safest place for them. 
That's the kind of place Red Hook was. I believe the courts define the relationship between government and the people. And the Justice Center is founded on the principle that everyone who comes through our doors, whether they walk in the front doors on their own or they're brought in the, ba the basement door by the police, everyone is a member of our community. They were members of our community before they had a case, while the case is pending, and when the case is over. This is an inclusive approach, and we treat people with respect. Downstairs, the police treat everyone coming in with respect. They're treated with respect throughout the building and in the courtroom. They're listened to in court, and we give them a voice in the final resolution of the case. The best way to approach these cases, if you think about it, most issues that hit the criminal courts, especially the lower level criminal courts, most issues are not in jail or out of jail issues. They're really social work issues. We have the goal, is we have social workers on site to identify the problem that brought the person to court, give a, a, a solution towards resolving that problem, use the power of the court to get them to do what they need to do to get their lives back on track. Their recommendations are social work professionals can and sometimes will include drug treatment and or alcohol treatment, mental health counseling, you won't believe how many people are walking around the streets and, all, and they're doing fine, and all of a sudden they can't get their medication. If something's been turned off, it's a problem. One would think those are the people we want to, in particular, be able to get their medication. But we can reunite them with, resolve the issue, get them back with the medication. Trauma-informed counseling has been really important for us, especially with kids. Job training, school attendance. We have a GED class for, for high school dropouts. If someone, a kid jumps, you know, in New York we have turnstiles to pay the subway fare, kid jumps at the turnstile at 11 o'clock in the morning, I'm able to say, how come, on a school day, how come you're not in school? And the answer on the case might be, take that GED test upstairs and enroll in the GED program, and we'll see how this case is going to work out. It's going to work out favorably if they do what they need to do. We knew when we opened, we covered a very poor area, the Red Hook Project's a very poor area, that what happens in the projects is role models move out. Your neighbor is not a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, a firefighter, because when someone attains that, they basically move out of the projects. They don't want to have the ability to move out, they move out. So the role models have moved down. We knew we had a be to be a beacon of education in our community. Our GET a GED teacher graduates about 18 per year since we started. When they graduate, we stop what we're doing in the courtroom. We have a graduation ceremony right in the courtroom to show them how important we think they are. We have a youth court. It's a court run by teenagers. The, the people involved in that youth court, about 15 to 20 every year, they get mentored by everyone in the courthouse, including our police officers and court officers. Almost all of them go to college. So we've been sending out every year a good 30, 35 kids who now see that college is a real option for kids from Red Hook. And it's changed the kids' approach. Where we used to be, you know, I might be going to college, maybe I'll go to college. Those kids are now starting to say things like, I want this college over this college. And that's a significant change, and that's what I love to hear. That college is becoming the default. Yes, they're going, it's just a question of where. And when you identify and address that underlying problem that brought the offender to court, you can stop the recycling of people through the justice system and through our jails. The court works. In a 500-page independent evaluation, Comparing the results from Red Hook, we compare with our traditional courthouse, which we have in the downtown courts, I call them the big box courts. Uh, the results show that the Red Hook court cut down crime, cut down recidivism. And the police love supporting the Justice Center. And the police love to support it, one, because they like to see people get clean, solve the problems, but really, the police are judged on their results. They're judged on numbers in New York. And right from the beginning, crime was low, we, well, we got crime low, and it stayed low. So the police support the Justice Center, the community supports the Justice Center because they feel, they feel that they're treated fairly, that they're given a shake, and they see the court as a balance between the police and the community. But I have to tell you, part of our mission is to bring police and court and uh, community together, and the relationship in our community, and in our area, between the police and the community is really excellent. And the community is there to help the police, and they do help the police whenever, whenever any issues arise. Now, we also, according to this evaluation, when you reduce crime and recidivism, you actually save millions of dollars in victimization costs. So we're a court that cuts crime, cuts recidivism, saves millions of dollars. 
And these savings don't, don't even include what happens when you turn a neighborhood around. There was nothing in Red Hook when we started. The police say we're one of three reasons for the turn. Around in Red Hook, the police say it's the police, they say it's the community, they say it's the Justice Center. We had an abandoned building that now has been filled with Fairway. It's kind of like Whole Foods, a big grocery store, 266 jobs. We had a vacant toxic lot. IKEA took that, turned it into the largest IKEA in the United States. Sales tax out of that, that IKEA is $6 million a year for the state. So that's what happens when you turn a neighborhood around. You're going to get businesses invested. We're the home port for the Queen Mary, too. They're not docking you know, that cruise liner there if there was still gunfire in the streets. Red Hook is now a great place to live and work. And most importantly, the United States leads the world in incarcerating our people. And at arraignment, courts throughout the country, and arraignment is the first time a defendant brought, to the, brought in front of the judge, courts throughout the country, judges have two choices, in jail, out of jail. Because we have social workers on site, we got a valuable third option. And that is release on condition of treatment. So you're telling someone, I will release you so long as you engage in whatever the social work professionals recommend. Again, you're back to drug treatment, mental health treatment, the real reason that brought the offender to court. It's monitored very, very, very carefully. Because I have social workers on site and can include it in my decisions in court, offenders were 15 times more likely to go to jail on the same kinds of cases downtown than they were at Red Hook. So we released significantly more people and still were able to cut down crime and cut down recidivism. It's also why this way of approaching this savings of millions of dollars, this reducing crime, it's why there are courts across our country based upon Red Hook, a court in Melbourne, Australia, Vancouver, Canada, Durban, South Africa, Israel just opened too, Wisconsin's looking to open up a court and it's also why we need a community court in Chicago, which is something I've always wondered why they haven't had one, especially you know, going to school here in Notre Dame, being so close to Chicago. It's something that's always been part of my heart. The New York Times praised Red Hook for cutting down incarceration, and the Guardian newspaper said Red Hook could change the face of justice in the United States. But that's, you know, the social workers are really part of it. Um, and first of all, while we do have conferences like it was described, due process comes first, problem solving comes second. Um, but what happens is when you're able to offer treatment and you're willing to work with them uh, in a fair manner, you get a lot of people electing to do that. So at any given time, we have about 160 people in treatment doing what they need to do to get their life back on track. And as we know in court, one person standing in front of the judge, that person has a spouse, partner, children, all are affected negatively when that person has you know, drug, alcohol, trauma issues, mental health issues that are not being dealt with. And what we do is as a court, we reach out to the people before us. Many are poor, many without an education, some are homeless, many with drug and or mental health issues, and we treat them with decency, honesty, respect, and say, how can we help? At the beginning and during treatment, I bring everyone up to the bench. And I have to tell you, I've only started doing this the last two or three years. I've been at Red Hook 15 years, so I'm, I'm still learning. We bring them up to the bench, talk to them, shake their hand on making the decision to get down the road of, of getting clean and using services. And then I want to find out what's important to them. Because I deal sometimes with people who have been to jail 10, 10 20, 30, 40 times. Not at Red Hook, not through my court, but they get arrested in my area and they've been through that downtown court you know, doing life in prison 30 days at a time, you know, time and time and time again. And now they're out here. And, you know, jail is not the answer in terms of me saying, well, if you don't do what you need to do, you're going to go to jail. They've been there, done that. I want to know what's their triggers, what's important to them. So I asked. One told me his daughter, 12-year-old daughter, won't talk to him. Another said his wife won't let him see their three children. Another said his wife hasn't looked at him the same since he started using drugs five years ago. For those who want justice with compassion, a community court shows them this way to a better life. And for those who want their courts tough on crime, as I said, we monitor people, we hold them accountable. We don't just shuffle them through the jail system. But what's happening in our country, on many cases that come through the courts across this country, people deserve a real chance before they're locked up. And at Red Hook, they get that opportunity. They get support, they get encouragement. They know we want them to be successful. Here are just a few of their stories. A teenager using 10 bags of heroin a day. Family torn apart by her addiction. She got clean, stayed clean, is working, and the family is together. A 
woman who was destitute, living in the streets, lying in the gutter, got clean. She found a job. She graduated from community college. She then graduated from a four-year college. She asked me to perform her wedding ceremony. It was such a great day for me. A woman who ran away from home. Her family desperately tried to find her for 10 years. She's out of touch with her family. She gets clean. She asked me to perform her wedding ceremony. And her father tells me that he had prepared her eulogy. He tells me this at the reception. I prepared my daughter's eulogy. And I looked at him and I said, I, I don't understand. And he said, I always thought the next call I would get would be from the hospital <coughs> saying she had overdosed. And there were so many young people in our family who didn't get a chance to know what a wonderful person my daughter was. A man who was living in his car, addicted to heroin, got clean, stayed clean, got married, had a child, and a child, he said, never would have been born if he didn't get clean and stay clean at Red Hook. Many of these people, I said, had long criminal records. Some had been in state prison, but we were able to help them turn their lives around. I learned at Notre Dame to reach out to others, even those who are poor and sick with addiction, to treat all people fairly and with compassion while doing justice, speaking them to them one to one. I guess, I guess you could say not, you know, not prejudging them, working with them. But this approach didn't begin with me. It began a century ago with Father Soren, was passed on to Father Cavanaugh, Father Ted, Father Malloy, Father Jenkins, generation to generation, students and to alum, and is part of the fabric of Notre Dame. I have never, I've been, had an opportunity to speak in a number of different places. I've never said this publicly, because it's very personal. But it is one of the great feelings in the world to know that as a judge, I had some part of helping each of these people address their addiction and rebuild their lives and the lives of their family. I choose to share this with you because this is the spirit of Notre Dame and it comes from each one of you. Over the years, you've nurtured, you've valued, you've set the example of the Notre Dame spirit every day of your lives. We are all keepers of that precious flame. So I want to end by telling each and every one of you, truly from my heart, you also helped get that teenager turn her back on heroin and reunite with her family. You also helped raise that woman from the gutter to get a college degree. You also helped reunite that family with a daughter who's now drug free, the daughter they were prepared to give a eulogy for. And you also have a piece of a little boy walking around Brooklyn, New York, born to a father who got his life together because it's the Notre Dame spirit that's in all of us. Thank you very much. <laughs>